Welcome to your Grade 8 English Language Arts Lesson 1 for the week of June 1st through June 5th. This lesson is presented by yours truly, Miss Alexis Wiley from the Office of Secondary English Language Arts. The theme for this unit is the challenges of living in a divided nation. Our essential question is, how can one individual challenges reflect the struggles of an entire nation? After today's lesson, you will be able to analyze dialogue in the drummer boy of Shiloh and determine how dialogue reveals aspects of character, propels the action, and provokes decisions. Last week, we read about whether the freedom quilts existed or if they were just a legend by examining texts that offer different information about the truth behind the freedom quilts. We also review what makes a good argument. Today, we will read a historical fiction text entitled The Drummer Boy of Shiloh. Historical fiction adds a human perspective to the facts, dates, and statistics that often come with the study of the past. Reading stories such as The Drummer Boy of Shiloh allows us to gain insight into key events in our country's history in a way in which a history textbook cannot provide. Let's watch a brief video about the Battle of Shiloh. While viewing the clip, take notes on a few facts you've learned. Shiloh is said to be Hebrew for place of peace, but it becomes the site of one of the deadliest conflicts of the Civil War. Fought in a quiet corner of Tennessee, it is the first major battle in the war's Western theater. In April of 1862, a Union army under General Ulysses S. Grant is camped out along the Tennessee River, awaiting the arrival of reinforcements before heading south to attack the Confederates. But Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnson attacks first. The Union forces are so unprepared that they're actually still making their breakfast. Some of them are still sleeping in their tents, and they are almost completely overrun by this uh, surprise attack. The Confederates drive the Union Army back toward the Tennessee River, threatening to destroy it. But the Union line holds at a critical point that becomes known as the Hornet's Nest. And this is where Grant, in the midst of this Confederate offensive, turns to his commander, Benjamin Prentiss, and says, you have got to hold this position at all costs. And Prentiss and his men do just that. By the end of the day, uh, the ground is littered with dead. It is probably one of the most fierce points of concentrated fighting in the entire war. General Johnson is killed in the first day's fighting, and General Pierre G.T. Beauregard takes over, confident he will sweep the field the next day. But reinforcements swell Grant's ranks during the night, and he launches a counterattack in the morning. The result is a Union victory, but one that comes at a high price. The cost was greater than any battle that had been fought so far in the war. And it demonstrated that the North, it demonstrated that Grant was willing to pay whatever price was necessary to achieve his goal. And once that baseline had been established, then the Union victory was assured. Because Union resources, Union manpower were much greater than those available to the Confederacy. The only question was, would the Union be willing to expend it? And Shiloh suggested that, yes, the Union would. What a history lesson. It's ironic that the battle was called the Battle of Shiloh because Shiloh means a place of peace in Hebrew. Who knew that this was one of the deadliest battles in the Civil War? Both sides experienced many casualties. The Union Army lost 13,047 soldiers and the Confederate Army lost 13,724 soldiers. At the time, drummers, young boys from about 7 to 12 years old, marched with the armed soldiers into battle. These were a few facts I learned from the video. Remember that the Civil War lasted from 1861 to 1865 and led to the abolishment of slavery in the United States. The text that we will read today is The Drummer Boy of Shiloh. It was written by Ray Bradbury. 
He is best known as a science fiction writer. He also written plays, mysteries, fantasies, realistic stories, and novels. In this story, Fred Berry tells about a drummer boy on the night before the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War. This two-day battle began on April the 6th, 1862, near the southwestern Tennessee church from which the bloody clash takes its name. More than 23,000 soldiers died during these two days. At that time, it was the bloodiest battle in American history. Today, we will read and annotate a text paying attention to actions and dialogue. Remember, the actions and words of people and or characters often reveal something about their personalities. Words and actions can also reveal development of plot and work to move the story forward. The general stopped and made a little pile of winter leaves and twigs in the darkness, as if he might at any moment strike fire to them to see his way through the coming days when the sun might not show its face because of what was happening here and just beyond. The boy watched the hand stirring the leaves and opened his lips to say something, but did not say it. The general heard the boy's breath and spoke himself. Let's think about this chunk of text right here. I ask myself, what does this action reveal about the general? First, I'm thinking about what is the general doing right now? He stopped and made a little pile of winter leaves and twigs in the darkness. So if any moment he could strike a fire, bingo, right there. The general actions reveal that he is a he is strategic, he's insightful, he's a planner. He is gathering materials needed for a fire just in case something happens later. As leaders, that's what generals do. They plan ahead for things that might come. Let's continue on with the next chunk of text. Why am I telling you this? That's what you wanted to ask, eh? Well, when you got a bunch of wild horses on a loose rein somewhere, somehow you got to bring order, rein them in. These lads, fresh out of the milk shed, don't know what I know, and I can't tell them. Men actually die in war. So each is his own army. I got to make one army of them. And for that boy, I need you. Me? The boy's lips barely twitched. Now, boy, said the general quietly, you are the heart of the army. Think of that. You are the heart of the army. Listen now. And lying there, Joby listened. General spoke on. If he, Joby, beat slow tomorrow, the heart would beat slow in the men. They would lag by the wayside. They would drowse in the fields on their muskets. They would sleep forever after that in those same fields, their hearts slowed by a drummer boy and stopped by enemy lead. But if he beat a sure, steady, ever faster rhythm, then, then their knees would come up in a long line down over that hill, one knee after the other, like a wave on the ocean shore. Had he seen the ocean ever? Seen the waves rolling in like a well-ordered cavalry charge to the sand? Well, that was it. That's what he wanted. That's what was needed. Joby was his right hand and his left. He gave the orders, but Joby set the pace. So bring the right knee up, and the right foot out, and the left knee up, and the left foot out. One following the other in good time, in brisk time. Move the blood up the body and make the head proud and the spine stiff and the jaw resolute. Focus the eye and set the teeth. Flare the nostrils and tighten the hands. Put steel armor over the men, for blood moving fast in them does indeed make men feel as if they'd put on steel. He must keep at it. At it. Long and steady. Steady and long. Then, even though shot or torn, those wounds gotten hot blood in blood heat help stir would feel let's pause for a second here and let's discuss this chunk of text first 
The general used a metaphor here to capture how he views the drummer boy. Take a second or two to identify the metaphor. If you identify this chunk of text right here, you are the heart of the army. You are correct. We know that we cannot live without our hearts. Is the general telling the drummer boy that he is the lifeline for the soldiers? Remember, this is a child the general is talking to. And when we look further down into that same text, if we look at this chunk of text, the general is motivating Joby in this portion of the text. Okay, we can say he's blowing his head up. He is describing the cause and effect relationships of his drumming on the soldiers. Right here, it says Joby was his right hand and his left. The general gave the orders, but Joby set the pace. Now it's your turn. As you move through the text, continue and continue to annotate how the general's words and actions affect Joby. This will help you determine how dialogue reveals aspects of the character, propels the actions, and provokes decisions. Here's a sneak preview for your show it today. You will be asked to respond to the following prompt. What makes what might have happened in the story, the drummer boy of Shiloh, if the general had not stopped and talked to the drummer boy the night before the battle? What message does this send about the power of conversation and human connections? And that's a wrap. Stay safe out there. Have a great week. Hi, and welcome back for another ELA GT8 lesson. This is lesson two for the week of June 1st through June 5th. It is called Evaluating Reasoning and Evidence. And as I mentioned last week, um, this is going to do with commencement speeches, specifically commencement speeches, which is very appropriate for this time of year. Um, once again, my name is Trista Gordon, and I'm happy to be with you today. The outcome for this lesson is that you will analyze the reasoning and evidence in order to evaluate the effectiveness of arguments and claims offered in commencement speeches. Think about it. In this remote environment, messages we hear to celebrate important transitions from middle school to high school and from high school to college and career are really more important than ever. What would you like to hear in a message celebrating the end of middle school? Okay, I'm gonna repeat that question, thinking about your situation right now. What would you like to hear in a message celebrating the end of middle school? Take a minute to think about that. Okay, let's look at some possible responses. Congrats, you made it through some challenging times. That's for sure. Couple more here. Communication has been different. You will continue to make more friends. Find joy in new scenery, including new teachers. Looks like that may be positive or depending on your opinion, maybe not. You can read a few more. I really like that you can reflect and celebrate the success you have had and will continue to have. And then of course, opportunities for new interests, new subjects, sports, and hobbies. Hopefully you came up with some of these great responses. I'm not sure if you've had the opportunity to watch Barack Obama's recent speech, his virtual commencement speech. If you do get an opportunity, I strongly suggest you do so. And I just wanted to reference it because he is such an effective speaker. And um, these are a few things that he did in his speech that made it so effective. 
It was filled with hope. He did not sugarcoat our current challenges. In other words, he was honest. He was not defensive or angry, no boasting, very comforting, um, not political, and very human. And he did add humor. Okay, we're going to review the rhetorical situation. The rhetorical situation is really how the speaker connects with the audience at this particular occasion, and also what message the speaker delivers to the audience on this occasion. Okay, we are gonna review some structural terms and then we'll move on to meaning. The first one is anaphora, which is the repetition of the same word or groups of words at the beginning of phrases, clauses, or sentences. And you can see in yellow, the phrase that's repeated in books. And a syndeton. It's tricky to say, a syndeton. You can try it. And it's the deliberate omission of conjunctions between words, phrases, or clauses. Um, even though these terms are a bit technical, um, they're not really part of our talking vocabulary. However, when we're looking at um, devices that authors or writers are using, these are two of the ones that you may find. A few more for structure, hypophora, raising questions, then answering them. Parallelism, you can see the example with the similarity of structure with the words, the series of related words there, and of course, repetition. Moving on to meaning, we have antithesis. And you can see in the example, the contrasting ideas. Metaphor, which you should be very familiar with, this implied comparison between two things of unlike nature, yet have something in common. And again, not using like or as, that would be a simile. Um, the metaphor can be very powerful. It is important that you understand the terminology used in the metaphor. For example, the question of federal aid is a bramble patch. If you don't know what a bramble patch is, you wouldn't know that the speaker is emphasizing a negative connotation there. And the rhetorical question. Okay, this is gonna be different because it's asking a question not for the purpose of eliciting an answer, but for the purpose of asserting or denying something obliquely. I'm not gonna say too much about the Appeals, we've been over this several times, keeping those in mind as you look at the speech. You're going to be wanting to use some of these um, in your analysis when you do evaluate, okay? Okay, in the past, I know that you've had an option to select a speech or in some cases an article to read. For this lesson, you will be reading two speeches, and it's important that you do so with the intention of deciding which speech is most effective based on your evaluation. So the first speech was delivered by award-winning actress Octavia Spencer in 2017 at Kent State University, and maybe she looks familiar to you. She is a celebrated American actor known for her role in Hidden Figures, among other films. So I included a picture of hidden figures there to the right. The second speech you'll be reading was given by Paralympic medalist Chris Waddell, excuse me, Christopher Waddell in 2011 at Middlebury College. 
Um, he is one of the most decorated male skiers in Paralympic history. So you can see the two pictures of him there. Okay, let's get started with some practice annotations so I can model for you the thought process. We're going to start with um, Octavia Spencer's speech. She begins, the journey you take now will be led by you alone. Let me say that again. The journey you take now will be led by you alone. Don't let that scare you. Oh no, let that liberate you. Remember, no one came here the same way and you won't all achieve success the same way. But because you all have shaped your path to graduation in a way that is uniquely and undeniably yours, I am pretty confident that you will continue to do that. But as you move forward, please, 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 oh please, don't let yourself get caught up in the trap of comparison. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, based on our rhetorical devices, you're going to see this question below in yellow on the next few excerpts, and it's something I want you to think about. Hopefully here from the beginning, I'm going to use the highlighter to highlight what stands out first and foremost, and I'm sure you would agree with me. She even says, let me say that again. So we're really seeing... Um, and forgive me for my highlighting line. I'm not sure how straight it's going to be. Um, she's repeating this opening for emphasis. Okay, again, the rhetorical situation, we're thinking about the message being sent as well. Um, and then as we keep reading, there is more repetition, not just there. She emphasizes same way. Think about the message in that sentence. And then also, not just twice, but four times, the word please. OK, another excerpt in her speech further along, she says to stay focused, but stay focused so that your change and growth is intentional. Don't let who you're becoming be shaped by disappointments. And also don't let yourself be shaped by achievements either. Remember your Kipling. If you can meet with triumph and disaster, but treat those two imposters just the same, treat them just the same. Okay, um, I just wanted to point out here, she does reference um, Kipling with a quote, and we want to think about um, that reference. You might want to think about pulling in your appeals here, ethos, okay, the credibility of um, who she is quoting, perhaps. Okay, let's look at one last excerpt from her speech. You could quietly read it, and then we will look at what you found. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about repetition anymore. If you do see words repeated, you can note that. Um, I do want to focus on something a little different here that contributes to meaning. Um, and I want to start first with a metaphor, which isn't very noticeable in terms of sometimes we're used to seeing the metaphor in a phrase saying one thing is the other. But I do want to point out that this concept, open doors, okay, is being used metaphorically. So when she says the talent will continue to open doors for you, not literally open a door, but that door 
is an opportunity. So the metaphor is in opening doors as opportunity. Okay, and then the other thing that we had already mentioned, but I'd like you to see it again, is that ethos piece. And we see it when we look at, um, she says, trust me, I know. And is she a credible source? That is the question we're asking. She has been through this. She has had many experiences. So really talking to the audience to trust her because she does have that experience, ethos. Now we're gonna look at an excerpt from the second commencement speech. This one's by Christopher Waddell, and we are gonna continue annotating. I am gonna encourage you to listen to that repetition, but we're gonna look past it right now. We're gonna dig a little deeper for another technique and I'll pose a question after I read aloud. People often ask me if I could go back and change history, would I? It took me a while at first because it would be great to be six feet again. When you're 410, the view doesn't change that much and it's often not that great. I wouldn't trade the accident for the experiences that I've had. I wouldn't trade walking for the person that I've become. It makes me wonder, Looking back at myself, when I was in college, my plans weren't well formed, but I can tell you for a fact that they didn't include any of what I've done. And also I know for a fact that there wouldn't have been any straight lines. Okay, the question he poses at the beginning, if I could go back and change history, would I? Would you say that this question is an example of a rhetorical question or hypophora? Okay, hopefully you answered hypophora and you understand why. Reason being, he answers his question, okay? And I want you to take note, by him answering this question, kind of creating this moment with the audience of really creating a bit of a relationship with the audience. And his story is emotional to begin with, but hopefully you can see this even heightens the emotion. See a lot of pathos here. Okay, after you finish reading both speeches and annotating, it's time to show what you know through a discussion. And it's called, Which One and Why? And you're really going to select which speech was most effective at communicating the message. Use evidence from both speeches in your response and be sure to capture the message. And also respond to another classmate as to whether or not you agree with their reasoning and why or why not. Okay, as always, I leave you with some final thoughts. And as we think about what's coming next, what will your wishes and or advice be to others who follow in your footsteps? Something to think about for the lesson for next week. Have a great day, everyone.